So hello everyone uh, and welcome to NASPA advancing hashtag first gen forward for 100 years. This is a live briefing in one of what will be a several several briefings of a series coordinating by the NASPA 100th anniversary educational subcommittee. Uh, my name is Maria Hinao Ohms, pronouns she, her, hers, and I serve as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at Hamilton College. I have the pleasure of serving as moderator for today's conversation and I'll introduce our panelists and uh, folks who you will be hearing from today in just a couple moments. But I wanted to first um, just share the intended purpose of this briefing. And so the purpose for why we put together this briefing is to explore NASPA's ongoing commitment to first generation students. So as I mentioned, you will meet the panelists in a few moments. And we, what they will share with us is just, just sharing with us firsthand accounts from folks who have um, participate in the evolutions of NASPA's commitment to this population of students, um, beginning with the formation of the NASPA Undergraduate Fellows Program to the thoughtful exploration, advocacy, and study of matters uh, that affect the population being done by the socioeconomic and class issues in higher education knowledge community, and then most recently, the establishment of the Center for First Generation Student Success. So uh, joining us on the panel today is Dr. Leslie Ann Brown Henderson, who serves as the Executive Director of the Department of Campus Inclusion and Community at Northwestern University. Steve Jenks, who's currently uh, pursuing his PhD in higher education at the University of Denver, where he focuses on college aspirations and access for students from rural and low income communities and also serves as a national chair for NASPA's socioeconomic and class issues in higher education knowledge community. Dr. Sarah E. Whitley, who's the senior director for the Center for First Generation Student Success at NASPA and Dr. Stephanie Gordon, who's vice president for professional development at NASPA. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> And so we're going to start off by um, having Leslie Ann share a little bit with us about her experience um, as an as enough and now an alum of what was known as MUF in the past and is now known as the NASPA Undergraduate Fellows Program. Um, and her experience as a first generation uh, college student and how NASPA her, helped her transition. So if you could share with us a little bit, Leslie Ann, and just start us off. Sure. Um, so hi, everyone. It's always an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to my community, my NASPA community, um, but certainly to speak about the NUF program, or when I was a part of the program, it was called MUF, which stood for Minority Undergraduate Fellows Program, and now it's the NASPA Undergraduate Fellows Program. Um, so as I often say that being first generation, a first-generation college student in the early 2000s for me, um, well, really just 2000, or late 90s and 2000s, it wasn't quite a thing. So there wasn't a whole lot of conversation on our campus about the first generation experience. There wasn't set services or staff set aside or even scholarly research broadly disseminated around what that experience was like. So to many people's surprise, um, you know, I moved to the United States when I was 13 years old and kind of navigated high school by myself. College was always something that my parents impressed upon me and said, like, this is an expectation, but there was no guidance as to how to get there. Um, so I ended up at the University of Miami, and the way that I ended up there was literally was the first kind of brochure I got in the mail. And I was like, that's where I want to go. Um, and thankfully, I got into that's where I want to go, but I had no idea of private versus public, um, the difference of cost, um, why I should maybe pay attention to those things and what it would ultimately mean for my family financially to attend a private university. Um, so I got to Miami and I had a great time and thankfully there were a lot of students just like me who were new to the US or whose parents hadn't gone to college. So it wasn't necessarily a unique experience in that um, I was all by myself but it was certainly something that we didn't discuss broadly. So it wasn't something that we had community around or we kind of helped each other because a lot of us, basically you knew that people were new to Florida or new to college, but you didn't know what to talk about because you didn't know what you didn't know kind of thing. Um, so my senior year, I had been involved in a lot of things on campus and our then vice president of student affairs, who is currently still vice president, Pat Whiteley, asked me if I'd ever thought about student affairs as a career. And of course, I'd never thought about it. And that's when she introduced me to the, the MUF, then MUF program. Um, what that program did for me at the very beginning was connect me with a mentor. 
and my mentor was was and still is Renee Dickens Callen. She's still at the University of Miami and she just finished her dissertation looking at the first generation college experience. So it's very cool to think about how um, we've influenced each other throughout the years and how maybe part of my journey um, is a part of what she wrote about during her dissertation. So she was really my first connection point and she had gone to the University of Vermont and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to Vermont, um, but I'm really interested in graduate school. And um, now looking back, I wish I'd gone to Vermont because it's very close to Montreal where um, my older sisters and my some of my family um, resides currently. Um, but she really started to tell me this is, you know, this is the field. This is, um, she was the director of student activities at the time. This is what working in student activities is like. Um, so she really took me under her wing. She gave me a lot of really unique experiences. I saw the student activities board. I kind of co-advised with her and did a lot of things in that first year. So NUF was really my introduction to the field, but I think what it further did for me was provide me with two opportunities. One was what was then called the Summer Leadership in, um, in the Summer Leadership Institute, which is now called the Dungey Leadership Institute, and also summer internship opportunities. Both of those experiences brought in my network. So um, I met people that I really wouldn't have met. I met a lot of other fellows. I was the only fellow on my campus. So to go to the Summer Leadership Institute and to meet 30 or 35 other young, talented, brilliant folks who were interested in the field just like me, who came from similar backgrounds, was not only eye-opening, but it was inspiring. A lot of those folks have become my colleagues and people that we've kept in touch with over the years. Um, and then I met Gwen Dungy and Stephanie and um, Janetta Cross Brazil and all of these people, Sue Borrego, um, Juan Guardia, so many people who have remained a part of my network and have really um, been a part of this journey through and in the field with me. So that was one part of it. And then um, just this, our summer internship opportunity landed me in Texas. So I'd never been to Texas before. I really had no interest really in to go to Texas um, as a girl from the Caribbean and, um, and from Canada. But I ended up there and what was amazing was my internship was in the Vice President of Student Affairs office. We had a brand new vice president. His name was um, is Dr. Dean Brashani, who's now president of a university. Um, but he took me under his wing. He was new and I was new and we together um, started learning a &M. He trusted me in ways that I don't know a vice president would trust someone right out of undergrad, but um, I told him about my experience with the Summer Leadership Institute and convinced him to bring it to Texas A&M, which he was like, let's do it, write up a proposal and let's do that. Um, so he and then they um, recruited me to graduate school there. So I ended up spending instead of my six week internship, I spent seven years <laughs> at Texas A&M University completing two masters and a PhD there. So, you know, when I think about my first gen experience and the NUF or MUF program, um, it was so instrumental and it continues to be so instrumental in my journey in the field of student affairs, the connections that I've been able to make, and the places that I think is really important for me to give back as a, now a first-gen professional. Thank you, Leslie Ann. And, and so that makes me, you know, that makes me wonder, um, Steve, if you could give us a little bit of insight into what your, the knowledge community that you chair, what its efforts, um, what the purpose, and then also what its efforts are doing to support um, this population to do research in this area and to just engage um, the unique needs of first generation students. Sure. Um, first, shout out to, to Nuff and the Summer Leadership Institute. I'm also an <laughs> alum of those programs. And uh, for any professionals uh, that are paying attention to this, definitely um, consider mentoring and encouraging undergraduates to participate because it was truly life changing. Um, it was actually my introduction to getting started with NASPA and seeing a lot of what was available as far as what I could do to give back to the field and to give back to everything that supported me and my development. And it was definitely my bridge into finding about uh, finding out more about knowledge communities. 
Um, and so now I am fortunate enough to be the current national chair um, of the socioeconomic status and class issues in higher education knowledge community. So it's kind of long. Um, but basically what we look at in part of our mission is to kind of support all areas of class issues within the higher education realm. And so uh, what that means for us mostly is supporting students like first generation students, but also other students from other backgrounds who um, come from a low income or poor working class um, area. We are starting to look more at middle class and upper class issues as well. Um, and of course, how those populations interact with each other on our college campuses. Um, so a lot of what we do is programming at the regional and at the national conferences. Uh, we also try to do a lot of online programming, um, a lot of social media. We have a lot of social media presence in a couple of different areas. Um, and our knowledge community is a little unique in that we have one um, broad knowledge community and then we also have some smaller sub-communities. Um, one is for professionals from the poor and working class. So anybody who identifies as someone who came from a poor working class background, um, we have an area where we're doing research, um, we're creating camaraderie and community around that. And then we also have one um, that focuses on homelessness and foster care. Um, and so those are sort of the, the two bigger issues that we cover. Um, some of the other areas that don't have their own official subcommunities, but we have a lot of work in are um, student support who need emergency aid, um, uh, food pantries, housing insecurity. Um, we kind of do a lot of different things. We cast a pretty wide net um, and we have a lot of really awesome people who are doing research around those issues. Um, as far as working with first generation students specifically, um, we've been lucky to partner with the Center for First Generation Success through NASPA for the past couple of years, um, helping to get programming going, helping to raise awareness about the new center um, through publications, through our social media, through hosting events with each other. Um, and helping to kind of bridge that gap because there is a lot of intersectionality often between um, first-gen students and low-income. Um, one of the things that we're pretty cautious about when we're working with first-gen students is not to make the assumption that they're, they're low-income. Of course, um, we have first-generation students who come from very affluent families and we have low-income students who come from families with college education. So um, making sure that you're kind of looking out for students and all of their different intersectional needs um, is a big part of what we're doing as well. Um, and then sort of moving forward, we are constantly working with other knowledge communities, helping to bridge opportunities to um, have those inter those interdisciplinary discussions. Um, and then also to, to try to draw up more interest and in scholarship in those areas. Um, we are hoping to launch a special interest fund soon so that we can have more funding availability to help um, pay for researchers to do um, different research projects and studies around these areas. Um, and then of course, we are trying to encourage more presentations at the regional, national, international levels. Um, and as always, as I mentioned, um, looking at the intersectionality between class um, and some of those other areas, and in particular, working with first-gen students. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, and so I'm wondering, Stephanie, NASA has, I mean, with the First Gen Center, which Steve alluded to just a second ago, um, that was a commitment that was very intentional, um, which is wonderful. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could talk about how, how it was that NASA made um, the decision to start going down the road um, and then eventually establishing the center. Sure. Sure. So one of the things I think is um, is great, and I so appreciate Leslie Ann's story and, and Steve's connection to the association. Um, this topic in particular for me is very personal because I also identify as a first generation student. Um, and similar to Leslie Ann, the first gen when I went to college was not a thing. Um, I But I knew my folks had not attended the uh, formal university experience. My dad was in the army. My mom was an x-ray tech at a local hospital. Um, and so as a recovering student affairs professional and now association professional. I um, I love these stories from, from Steve and Leslie Ann about the communities in which we build um, in order to connect student affairs professionals to the association. Um, we, uh, as, as NASPA is fundamentally a student affairs professional organization that helps student affairs educators support students, for many years we've been focused, of course, on the whole student, holistic development, and thinking about how um, we've gone from student personnel to student learning to now student success. Um, we have been focused on access for many, many, many years. And really over the last 10, 
or so years, we really have been focused more on this as aspect of making having students actually get through school. So as we close the books on our year-long celebration of our um, 100th anniversary, the student affairs professionals profession itself really is 120 years old, but we've been focused on the whole student and NASPA has been trying to do that and with all of our professionals. So we continue to look for programs and services and different ways to help educators use proven tools and services that can be um, implemented to execute student success. We all know, and there's a little mantra in enrollment, ma enrollment management, that it's, it's cheaper to keep a student on campus than it is to um, recruit another one. And so when we had been looking at all these boutique programs around the country, and one of them in particular was the First Scholars Program that um, a small family Family Foundation in Texas uh, had been working with a number of campuses to develop a holistic student services, student experience um, that focused on service learning and um, engagement, looking at a strengths-based perspective, um, engaging in academic advising, and really a holistic four-year experience, at, mostly at four years four-year big public institutions. Um, so we saw this program and continue to think about how many of these campuses around the country have been doing little things for, for first-generation students, not necessarily campus co um, collaborative, co comprehensive experiences for, for making first-generation students feel like they're connected. Um, and we saw the data, we all see the data, about one in three students who enter co college today are first generation students and that number is only gonna get bigger as we move forward. So when we were looking at these programs, we really thought, is there an opportunity here to partner with the Souter Foundation to develop and expand what they have worked on so well over these last few years. And think about these evidence-based programs that allow students to engage with structured experiences to help them navigate the challenges of higher education. So like NASPA always does, we tend to be a little bit innovative in that, pro in that program. And so we connected with the suitors and we thought about how can we develop something like the Center for First Generation Student Success that would be able to help scale the First Scholars Program to multiple institutions to help many student affairs educators connect with the, the basic frameworks of connecting to students to the campus. We all know this, connections are important, engagements are important to make it through college. Um, and so we decided that we would partner with the Suter Foundation and start what is the Center for First Generation Student Success, looking at the overarching higher education landscape. And as Steve was mentioning, looking at the fact that students aren't just one identity. They don't just identify as a first generation student. They have intersectional personalities, intersectional identities that connect to multiple ways. And so we knew the first step would be to create a landscape analysis, hire amazing staff in order to get this off the ground. And so um, so we are about a year or so, year and a half, year and four months into, into the center. And I'm smiling because Sarah was, of course, our first staff member in this process. And, um, and that has been a, a wonderful opportunity to both bring on new staff and then also just tap into the power of first generation students, both as alumni uh, alumni who um, who come from um, campuses often many student affairs administrators are first gen because we want to help others who are doing this work on campus to help them navigate help students navigate through their college experience and so we are really on the precipice of, of uh, functioning and connecting um, first scholars to, to really a larger a larger audience. So that's why and how and and I feel like it's it is key and fundamental to the association at its, at its core in helping student affairs administrators do their jobs well um, in order to um, help students. Thank you, Stephanie, and congratulations. It's kind of crazy how time flies, right? It's it just is. Like... It is absolutely crazy. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's it's really amazing. And I'm and it's just I don't know about you all, but I know that, you know, in the interconnection, it's I just remember the conversations and then the launch and now we're, you know, about to head into this this conference in 2019 and we're having this conversation today. Um, so it's really great. I know I've benefited a lot from um, what the center has offered just in the work that I do and I know I can probably speak very confidently from others that are listening to us and watching us that um, they probably have as well. So that's so great. Um, and I'm wondering, Sarah, could you tell us a little bit 
um, so far about what the plans are, what you've done, um, where the center's headed, um, you know, in the next few years or so? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Maria. Um, yeah, and you know, I think as we've had this conversation, um, the concept of community keeps coming up. I, I look across the screen, um, and <laughs> Leslie Ann kindly serves as a, a center advocacy group member. We have a really dynamic two-tiered advisory process um, with a center of experts and scholars around the country who help us think and shape the center, um, and it's a really important, uh, really important part of the work that we do. Um, and then, as Steve mentioned earlier, we have a great partnership um, with the knowledge community um, at annual conference. We have we host a reception together because it is really important for us to think about the intersectional work as well as we're building the center. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we we opened in June of 2017, um, six days after I joined NASPA, um, and so <laughs> it gave me a small grace period to get settled. Uh, um, and then we have we have hit the ground running since then. Um, and it's been a really, really exciting and and professionally rewarding endeavor, but also personally rewarding for me um, as like the folks on the screen. Um, I also identify as a first generation college student. And so um, and it's been really exciting to also see so many of our NASPA staff who also identify as first gen really embrace that identity um, and say, you know, how can we help? How can we support the center? Because I'm exploring that identity myself now as well. So really exciting work that we're doing. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy about the center's work is we have a really unique position positioning um, as a part of the NASPA community um, because most of the work around first gen has been directed towards students. Um, high school students trying to go to college, particular programs within college campuses serving students. We really have the uh, really fortunate opportunity to focus heavily on the student affairs, student success, academic, professional. Um, anyone really committed to student success and so thinking about kind of in the middle, uh, those those folks sort of in the middle there that are trying to deploy new programs and services, how can we support those efforts? Um, oftentimes, they're very, very busy people um, who have far too much on their plate already, and how can we lessen that load a little bit? Um, I thought it might be helpful to talk with you a little bit today about the four strategic priorities of the center um, as a as sort of a framework for the work that we've been doing over the last year. Uh, we've been really busy um, and had some exciting things happen in recent months and some exciting things coming up in the future. Um, so um, our first of our four strategic priorities include what we call connect and recognize. So the, the notion that we are committed to connecting individuals around the country to do good work around first gen, to share ideas, to share information, to connect their campuses. Um, early, early, probably the second week that I was with the center, um, someone said to me, we've been committed to first gen at my institution for over 30 years and we don't know who our peer institutions are in this work. And so finding ways to connect those campuses together to give them a home and a space. Um, and then to also recognize campuses who have committed to really outstanding work. Um, soon we're going to be launching a brand new program called First Forward um, that we're really excited about that will recognize campuses around the country who are doing outstanding work um, to, as we say, hashtag move first and forward. Um, so Really exciting for those. Really excited for those opportunities. Um, also, things like our brand new uh, NASPA conferences on student success and higher education that will happen in June of 2019, um, and for us in particular, the First Gen Student Success Conference is a part of that. Another great way to connect and recognize individuals. Um, that also leads us into um, another part of the center's work, which is scholarly knowledge and evidence-based practice. Um, I hope many of you, um, and I know my colleagues on the screen here, have also checked out um, a recent report that we released. As Stephanie mentioned, it was really important for us to take a look at what was happening across the country related to first generation student success. And so we launched um, a national landscape analysis at four year institutions um, and produced a report on that that came out in October of 2018 um, that's available on our website that really digs into what's happening across the country and then recommendations for improving practice and then how we can support those efforts. Um, right now, we're actually launching a similar project on two-year institutions. So we're excited to get um, a different perspective um, and to see maybe what's different and what's the same across those different populations. So lots of work around um, advancing research, um, advancing evidence, um, helping institutions understand what really is the best practice. Because sometimes now we see too many people just kind of picking and choosing and as I often say, 
throwing against the wall and hoping it sticks um, for our students. And I think we can, we all agree that we can do a little better than that. So really enjoy that side of the work that we do. Um, our third strategic priority is scalable and innovative approaches. And so that's an opportunity for us to offer programmatic solutions to campuses. Um, really going back to Stephanie's comment earlier about the original First Scholars program, how do we take the fundamentals of that program and turn those into solutions for campuses? Not only to offer those to small cohorts, but to scale those services um, across campuses and then across the nation. So really excited um, in the progress we're making there. I'm excited to have some new staff coming on board to lead some of those efforts um, and, and just, just really excited about what we'll be able to offer to campuses and to offer support to make sure those things stick for the long haul of the work. And then finally, our last strategic priority um, is about um, thought leadership and advocacy. Um, and we really want to be a place that people look to for information. Uh, we, uh, a year ago tomorrow, actually in January of 2018, we hosted a national convening on first generation student success, brought together folks from around the country to talk about the future of the center, the future of this work. Uh, we want to be a leader in that space, um, thinking about how we can support students and institutions um, and at some point as we move forward, also thinking about how do we shape um, local, state, federal policy around version, how do we support um, initiatives of that sort as well. So um, we have we have big visions and big goals, and I'm, I'm really excited about those um, and always love hearing from folks around the country what we can do to help and support. I have been overwhelmed with the reception we have received um, across the country as we're traveling about and getting to know folks who are just excited about our work. And so it's been um, a really fun part. Of, of my uh, my job of getting to grow the center and learn and um, hope folks will continue to reach out to us as a resource um, and support. Thank you so much, Sarah. So as we're waiting uh, for some of the some questions to pop in, I did want to throw a question out there to to all of you. Um, and I'm wondering what are some what are some of the issues that and and topics that you're seeing specifically to uh, focusing on first generation students that are that are coming up for institutions that you are seeing that maybe has have evolved or are things that are the same as they've been in the past that haven't been addressed. Um, so I'll just throw that out there for anyone who wants to who you know just to kind of set it out there for a conversation. It's certainly something I can talk about all day, every day. Um, but I'm happy to happy to get the conversation started. Um, you know, I, I think we see a, a couple of different high level things. One, um, what we see around the country often right now are very small boutique approaches to serving first generation students, cohorts of 20 students or 40 students who maybe are part of a scholarship program. And institutions are really struggling to scale approaches for first generation students. Um, how do we get students to think about their intersectional identity? Oftentimes, oftentimes right now, first generation programs are attached to another identity. So you may find a, a multicultural office hosting the first generation programming. Um, and while that can be fantastic, there also may be students who don't identify or attach to that program because they don't see themselves as a part of it. They don't see themselves reflected in it. So as campuses are grappling with that. Um, and, and what we often talk about is, is creating a network-based approach for that. Um, another quick example of something we hear quite a bit about is how do we extend the conversation beyond the traditional student affairs professional to faculty and to staff who maybe are outside of the student affairs or student success area? Um, how do we think about developing our faculty to think about the needs of first generation students in the classroom, creating more um, strengths-based approaches um, to teaching and learning, and, and even helping faculty identify as first gen in the classroom themselves, um, saying, okay, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify this and I'm gonna create this connection in my classroom. So that's something that we navigate quite a bit um, across the conversations that we have. But um, since I can talk about this all day, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues as well to, to chip in. I think one of the pieces to, to piggyback off of Sarah's comment is, is also having campuses think more uh, comprehensively about their services on campus. And, and we have been working at that for many years in many aspects and many identities. Um, we have been talking about silos and the collaborations between academic and student affairs. And, you know, I, I think we have gotten way past the discussion that 
um, oh, we're second student affairs as second class citizens to the environment in which um, we work in higher ed. And, and, I, and I'm so glad because really the only way to move forward in this is to say that the student is really experiencing their collegiate experience that has an academic component, a co-curricular component, and a component about career preparation. And so I, I think when we think when Sarah is mentioning all of the different aspects of, of our both our tiered process of of our, our different uh, strategic goals, the the higher education community has to really get over the siloed way that we do our work because students don't experience the college experience that way. Um, so hopefully this is just one more step toward um, toward building programs and services that will help students navigate that system. I think just to add, um, so I have really the honor at Northwestern of overseeing um, student enrichment services, which is our office for first gen low income and or undocumented students, as well as multicultural student affairs, as well as another office that does um, really important work around social justice education. So when the three directors and I come together, it's a really fascinating conversation about them, the numbers of students that we work with um, that cross all three of the offices and may not know that they're touching all the offices as well as how when we um, focus only specifically on first-gen students or on low-income students and at Northwestern um, being a highly selective private institution, a lot of the conversation really started with low-income students um, and kind of secondary came in um, conversations about first-gen students. But a lot of what has been focused on and a lot of what donors want to give to is the low-income student experience. So that has been really fascinating to watch and to kind of understand. And I, the way that I've made sense of it is that people want to do something. And if we say a student doesn't have a coat and a donor can give money for a coat, it's easy to see how that makes a huge difference, right, for a student in the moment. Um, so there, there are those conversations that are happening, but as we have um, our SES, Student Enrichment Services, and we've had a conversation that's been void of intersectionality, as Steve said, um, what shows up is students saying, well, I don't know if this is a place for me either, right? So I think um, one of our main focuses this year as a team is to really think about what does our collaboration look like, right? So how are we connecting dots for students and helping them flow through our spaces seamlessly? Um, how do they know that if they're a student of color and if they're a low income student or a first gen student that SES and MSA are awesome places for them to be and they don't have to choose one. Um, they don't have to choose their race over their first gen status or their socioeconomic status um, and that there's connection points there that are really powerful especially if they can make those connections in community. So that's a lot of the conversation that we've been having um, that at Northwestern, the conversation particularly around first gen status or low income status or socioeconomic status has been void of race. And that's been kind of said, that's the MSA's work. Um, and we've said, no, it's kind of all of our work and this is how we need to do it together. Um, and just to chime in, I guess, from the, the SES kind of proportion of that, um, you know, we have a, a lot of research and a lot of um, people that are doing programmatic things around how you can fund sort of to what sort of similar to what Leslie Ann was saying, like, how can we fund first generation students um, if they are low income to help them have a, a more positive transition into college? And then, of course, just the affordability in general. Um, there are studies and research that shows that first gen students, regardless of their income, so whether they were low income or high, um, high level, are more likely to get involved um, with campus employment and at higher levels, um, so working 20 or more hours a week, um, which in addition to all of the things you have to do in the classroom um, can really take a toll on them, but it's just an expectation that a lot of first gen students have when they come into the, the academic spaces. So um, helping to fund them it, and helping to guide them into different positions where maybe they wouldn't have to work quite as much so they can focus on academics, I think is a piece that we've been looking at. Um, and on the topic of community, again, uh, we always push for mentorship. And so some of the things that have come up in our leadership tables are things like how can you identify um, professionals, whether that be faculty or professional um, student affairs staff who come from um, poor working class backgrounds or who are first generation students and how can you kind of have people embrace that so that the students can see role models in themselves and see, you know, not only do they belong in college, but they can aspire to terminal degrees. Like there's lots of things you can do with that. 
Um, so pushing for that. And then the other thing that came up that was um, pretty fascinating was supporting students in their transition from their first to second quarters or terms. Um, so that retention rate from the first term to the second term um, is pretty critical for first generation students. And that's a pretty vulnerable population where we lose a lot of students um, moving from one place to another, whether that be dropping out entirely or changing schools or all sorts of things. And so um, one thing that I've seen that, that works really well or that I thought was a really great idea was um, hosting some sort of social on campus to celebrate the end of that first term and to just show students like, you made it, you did it, <laughs> you did a great job for that first term. Um, and we're excited to see you in the next term. And they kind of um, use that to help prevent any melt that can happen over the terms. Um, but of course, the, the funding piece is always going to be there. Um, the knowledge community is always looking at that, but I know institutions are always looking at that. Um, any sort of policy changes that can happen at an institutional, state, national level um, would be helpful in that regard. Um, and we've also seen that for, for some students who are low income, they're more apt to identify as first generation rather than low income because class issues are still pretty taboo. A lot of people don't want to come right out and say, I come from a poor working class background because that's just not an identity that they want to embrace at 18 years old if they're a, a traditional age student. Um, and so first gen is sort of like an, an easier way for some of our low income students if they identify that way um, to embrace that and to take advantage of some of the resources that campuses are offering without the stigma um, that typically is attached to it. Because um, I think we are starting to move, well, certainly I would say we're moving into a more celebratory um, state on campuses of celebrating our first generation students and not casting them aside or not mentioning it the way we did, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. One other thing that I'm add, um, that I'm seeing on at least our campus is that there's a lot of resources being put into the student as it should be, rightfully so. Um, but there's a lot of conversation around like how do we build resilience in certain students, name student X. Um, and one of the things that I've really challenged our campus to think about is not only resiliency, but the cost of resiliency. And then what is our responsibility as a campus community to also change the way that we function, our structures and systems and policies to also be welcoming and accommodating and a place where our first gen and low income students can thrive on campus. And I think it's both parts of the equation. So like I, I kind of shared that I oversee student enrichment services, multicultural student affairs, and our social justice education area is really, really important because they start conversations with students around class issues um, and talk about classism with students and what that experience is like. And some of these students have um, aren't low income or aren't first gen, but it's important for them to understand how they might be perpetuating a culture that feels unwelcoming um, for those students or um, small things that they might do, extra fees that they have for their club, all these small things that students don't necessarily think about. Um, or if they keep going out every Friday night to eat, or if that's the way that they bond, like all of those things, I think we all have a hand in creating a campus climate, um, a, a campus climate where everyone can thrive and it's everyone's responsibility. So I think as much effort as we're putting into making sure that our low income and our first gen students have the resources that they need to navigate and to be able to thrive within a system of higher education, we also need to be putting as much, if not more resources into changing the policy systems and increasing the education of everyone on campus. So it's not just one person or one group's responsibility to kind of assimilate or to figure out, um, navigate a system that wasn't necessarily meant for them. Um, but how both can meet half halfway. So I'm wondering Maria, that, you know, on? yeah, go right ahead. Sorry, yeah. can I jump in really quick? Sorry, I, yeah. I was trying to get in between Steve and Leslie, but I also want to let to <laughs> echo Leslie Ann's comments um, around the notion of creating um, student-ready environments for campuses, um, where we're thinking about how do you how do you do an inventory of your campus? Um, to because m oftentimes it seems like it's unintentional, but we we're creating policies and and, and jargon that we think work really well within our, and we're trying to be really student-centric, and at the end of the day, it doesn't work for students. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how do we ask those questions and think about from that that student-ready lens, that first generation lens. And so I really appreciated those comments. Um, 
I wanted to circle back really, really quickly to the very last comment that Steve made around being celebratory. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to just acknowledge um, NASPA's commitment um, and the center's commitment and partnership with the Council for Opportunity and Education for the National First Generation College Celebration Day each year. Um, every year on November 8th, we celebrate first generation students around the country. Um, and for me, it is such a low hanging fruit opportunity because you can do anything. You can announce your students, you can have a pizza party, you can announce a scholarship program, you could do the, the least and the most um, all in one day. Um, and so really, really exciting about the growth. Um, we were so overwhelmed with the growth from our first year to our second year um, and are really excited to make that um, an annual partnership and event and something that I'm really proud of NASPA and the center for committing to. So, um, and lots of information on the center's website about it if, it, if it's something that a campus is interested in getting in, but appreciated us, Steve's uh, throw out of the word celebratory to get us, get us moving there, so thanks. <laughs> So really quick, Steve, quick question for you that's come in. Um, how can folks get involved with your knowledge community? Uh, sure. Um, so for any knowledge community, um, the simplest you can do is just join our listservs <laughs> to get our information and our emails. Um, when you go into your NASPA portal, you can go into your profile and you check any of the communities or organizations, including um, the Center for First Gen Success. Um, you can check that off as well and it automatically adds you to those groups. So there's no formal like application process or anything. Everyone is welcome to all of these things. Um, and that'll add you into our listserv. And so you'll get any announcements about programs that we're having, or if you um, want to get involved in some way, any knowledge community is always excited to have um, blog writers or um, participants in uh, any of our various um, volunteer opportunities that we have throughout the year. Um, if you're attending the NASPA annual conference, um, at every NASPA annual conference, there's a knowledge community and graduate school fair. And during that time, you can meet all of the knowledge communities and find out what their missions are, um, what sort of help they're looking for, how you can be involved, um, and to meet the leadership and things. So that's kind of the, the best and easiest way to do that. Um, but of course, if you go to the NASPA website and look under constituent groups and find a community like the socioeconomic and class issues um, community that you really care about, you could reach out to any of the members and um, have a conversation with them and, and a dialogue about how you can get involved in that way as well. Thank you so much for that. Um... And maybe towards the end, if you want to share of anything that's coming up at the conference that you'd want to kind of tease in there, um, definitely let's do that. Um, so this is a question for, for the entire panel. Um, how can staff and faculty who identify as first generation college graduates create community? Um, can you all speak to how you build community among your peers who identify as first gen as well? So I'll jump in just uh, in the context of NASPA. So one of the very simple things that we do in this year, the first gen uh, flags at the NASPA annual conference will be uh, branded for the center as well. So it'll say the first, uh, first gen, but it'll have the center colors. Um, but at a conference um, or a workshop, if you can find a flag from the, um, the, the flag table to put on your name tag that you are a first gen um, individual, that would be wonderful. Um, I think also just really identifying verbally that you are, you identify as a first generation student. It allows to open up that door to provide a, a good way to communicate with each other knowing that I had absolutely no idea what the bursar's office was when I got to a college or university college campus. And so to be able to say, I, I navigated that too. I don't really, I didn't really understand how I did that. Um, and I know that there are so many campuses doing amazing things to identify um, either faculty, staff, or others who are first gen. And and whether it be a sticker on your door or whether it be that they are, uh, there are faculty pizza parties um, on on campus to be able to say, hey, I can get through this process. Steve mentioned to like, get a terminal degree to to be able to um, navigate that career process next. Um, so those are some simple things. I think even just putting it first forward and saying I am a first gen college student or was, um, I think that's a great way to put that. Last spring um, at Northwestern, um, our student enrichment services office, they um, had a marketing campaign called I'm First. And part of that campaign um, is they asked faculty and staff to join a registry um, that would live on, a, on the website where students could easily find 
who they were and where to find them. And in exchange, they got a t-shirt that said, I am first, and it was branded by Northwestern. And we had such a huge response um, to that. So it lives there and it's a place where students could always go back to and say like, I'm really struggling in biology perhaps, and I'd love to like connect with someone or this person might be from a similar background to me. I would love to connect with them. And it's a list of faculty and staff that live there. So that's available um, for students. And I think for me as a, as a professional, um, a large part of my network is what I talked about before through NUF. Um, so those folks who were fellows back in the day when I was um, a fellow are continue to be first gen. And I think, you know, we start talking about the first gen professional and what does that even mean and look like. Um, you know, being first gen doesn't begin in college and end in college. It starts way before that and ends um, probably almost never. So um, it's always an identity that I carry around with me. So building community amongst um, my NUF alums and then others, you know, Stephanie said that she's first gen and Upon meeting, we learned that about, I learned that about her, and that's something that I feel like I can lean on to her. And um, the work of the center is also a space where there's a lot of folks who identify and who care deeply. Um, so that's another, I think, community where it's easy to find people and um, to be mentors as well as just friends and to bounce ideas off of. I would echo the sentiments, I think, to um, extend into what Stephanie was talking about, making first gen a part of your standard introduction. So when you're announcing yourself, you know, for your first day that you're teaching a new class or you're offering a program to students or someone comes into your office, you know, that NASPA ribbon from your conference, take it back to your office and put it in your office. Put something in your office that has the center information on it. We have all kinds of swag of sorts that you can utilize for those spaces. Put a, you know, put an I'm first gen on your door, but also put it in your syllabus. Put it in handout information and start to own that identity. Um, other things that I, we would we would encourage people to do is volunteer to be on your first first generation steering committee or task force or volunteer to come to first generation if you have a student organization or, or a campus event that's related to first gen go and support those students um, host a dinner for first gen students anything that you can do to engage with that community and then really at, at kind of a higher level um, find opportunities within your daily work to provide specific first gen opportunities we love when faculty in particular will offer undergraduate research opportunities specific to first generation students or if you're going to pick six research assistants, make sure at least two are first gen. Um, if you're going to have student office assistants, think about making sure one of those students is first gen and sharing that identity and building that community. Um, so it doesn't have to be that you have to run the campus steering committee and be the only champion for first gen, but finding small ways to just contribute to the conversation is really important. And to echo Leslie Ann's point, um, you know, you're first gen before you go to college and you are first gen afterwards, but in the collegiate space is a, a unique time and space for you to really own that identity. I mean, I wouldn't say it at a cocktail party as like my fun fact, but um, at a college environment, it is something you can say. And so being able to own that as one of your, your primary identities, I think is a, a, a unique opportunity to do now, because for most of our students, once they graduate, it may never come up again. Like nobody's gonna ask them, you know, how did you navigate college? Did your parents go to college first? Like, it just doesn't really come up in most workforces. But for us, we have that opportunity to to acknowledge that we did it, we went through it, and also just to be kind of um, proud and even if self-deprecating about the challenges that we had as first-generation students, um, to talk about, you know, my first time riding a campus bus and not knowing you had to push a button to get off, and so I rode it for too long, or, um, you know, like Stephanie said, what's a bursar? What's a registrar? Like, what are these weird made up words that I still don't even know what they really translate to? Um, you know, helping them to, to figure out those different things and to show them that it, it's normal also to not know um, and that you're a resource. And then of course, um, partnering with colleagues, um, once you do know that that's an identity, um, leaning on them and kind of sharing in that experience as well. So, you know, we've talked a lot, you shared a lot about um, about how supporting uh, first generation students who are undergraduates. And I'm looking at you, Steve, as someone who's in a doctoral program and at the three other panelists who have completed doctoral programs. And I think one of the things we don't talk about a whole lot is that, so you mentioned, you know, your first generation forever, right? Like that doesn't ever end. And I'm wondering, 
how does that, what does that look like at the graduate level? I think, you know, as someone who has worked, worked exclusively with doctoral students in the past, most of them being first generation, I think that that's a conversation we're not having. Um, so how, how would you suggest to folks that are watching and listening um, to this conversation, how do we approach doctoral students and even master's level students? How, how are we supporting graduate students um, who tend to be forgotten, I think, a little bit um, because they've already gone through one degree. And so the assumption is that, oh, now, you know, you just know, you know, college, right? And that everything is new, no matter what. So, um, so if you could just share your insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's my third time. So I've been a first gen three times going through it. Um, and every time it brings its own unique challenges. And um, as most student affairs practitioners can probably assess, um, the number of sort of direct services also seems to diminish as you get further on in your career. So there aren't really quite as many club fairs for graduate students <laughs> um, at any level. And then, of course, at the doctoral level, you just get super busy. Um, I think what's been really helpful is having a strong support of mentors, um, not only from the NUF, NUF program, but I think the NUF program did sort of help me get the um, the self-advocacy skills to seek out other mentors later on. Um, and so I am blessed to have a really awesome mentor who whenever I get stuck with something, I can reach out to her and she'll explain it to me or she'll tell me what she did or give me some best practices. Um, and I use that to guide my process and then, um, you know, also, as you move up in, in an educational career, typically your cohorts get a little smaller and smaller. And so I'm also really lucky to have really great people in my program who also identify as um, first gen or other minoritized populations. And we're able to just kind of complain about the same things. And we're all at a new institution together and, and kind of discovering all of that. Um, not to derail this conversation, but um, the question did also remind me that a lot of the discussions we have around first generation students are for, you know, 18 to 22 year olds fresh out of high school. Um, but as we said, you're first gen forever. So if you wait until you're 40 to get your first degree, that's still your first time. <laughs> so um, being cognizant of that, particularly if you're um, either a commuter campus, community college or public institution, private, anything that has um, any population of what we would consider a non-traditional um, student, making sure that um, the programming that we do for first generation students is applicable to all populations so that we can encapsulate and support them if we can. And to Steve's point, I think we also have to remember that oftentimes when we're in the graduate school level, we're also navigating other things, families, full-time jobs, part-time jobs, caring for older family members, all kinds of other things that sort of expand the intersectional identity to parent or sibling or all kinds of other things that maybe may be coming to a head a little bit more. Um, so I think those are always things that we we strive to consider and thinking about that. Um, um, I would say that there are a number of schools in California who are doing some really exciting work around first generation graduate work. Um, the uh, University of California at San Francisco does some great work in thinking about how do first generation students navigate their community because imposter syndrome is real, no matter what, where we are. And there was a lot of nodding when I said that. So um, it is it is a real thing and it will come out of nowhere. Even if you're a very confident doctoral student, it will it will show up in your life. Um, and so thinking about about those things and also, you know, where are the support systems that you build for yourself um, when you're in those smaller cohorts is really important. Um, there are also some really interesting sort of external um, resources, um, things like um, on Twitter, there are a number of Twitter handles like, that are at First Gen Docs that are having conversations about what does it mean to be a graduate student um, and First Gen. Um, there are a number of handles of that sort. And there's also quite a bit of conversation that happens with the Empowering First Generation College Students Facebook group, which is a private, but please join it a Facebook group that is um, led by Latanya Reese Miles and Steve Desir at, um, out in California um, that the center is affiliated with. Lots of great resources and conversation. If you're just ever a doctoral student that's looking for some additional support and maybe you're trying to build a support network. So, um, but I, I appreciate Steve in the in the moment of going through all of this, sharing those, those thoughts. So um, I want to be mindful of time and uh, make sure that we're being we're staying to, you know, to time um, that we had created. I wanted to give, um, ask a quick question that just came in also for Leslie Ann before we wrap this up. But um, how can and um, how do practitioners help um, undergraduate students get involved with NUF? 
Oh, um, sorry, you saw the huge smile on my face. Yeah. Um, so there, if you go to the NASPA website, um, they're under constituency groups. Again, you can find information about NUF. The current national board chair is Dr. Tiffany Davis. And um, there are two times a year when you can apply to be a NUF fellow. Um, so you, what, it's required in the application is you'll fill out a couple essays and information about yourself and you have to have a mentor um, and one thing that I tell undergraduate students who are interested is really think think about who you might want to be your mentor it could be connected to your own social identities it could be connected to function um, what you think you might want to do I also tell them to think about time commitment who can who has the time to do it and maybe not now but at another time um, who can be a, a maybe primary and then secondary mentor to you perhaps um, so lots of different things to think about but that's how um, a student or a staff member who's interested in being a mentor could find out more about the program so I would go online on the NASPA website look um, for NUF and all the information will be there and then there's a deadline that's in the fall and then one that's in the spring um, that comes up where you can submit your application to be a part of it. Thank you, Leslie Ann. You're and so can you tell us a little bit, just if you have anything you'd like to tease coming up at the conference um, as it relates to your knowledge community and Sarah, even to the First Gen Center? Anything people should be um, looking out for that folks should be um, just keeping an eye for, it, especially as we're getting all of these, um, all of these emails and great information on how to prepare. Um, our schedules. Yeah, um, so I don't want to steal too much of the, the Center's thunder, but we are co-hosting um, a social and it'll be on Monday, March 11th uh, at 7 p.m. So if you look through the guide, you'll see that that's an event that we're hosting. Um, last year's event was a lot of fun. We had tasty food and there were some book giveaways this year. Um, we're still kind of ironing out what the program is going to be, but there's a lot of really awesome things happening with that. Um, outside of that social, I mentioned the Knowledge Community Fair. It's a really great way to learn about any of the KCs, um, but we will obviously have a table there as well. Um, and then all of the Knowledge Communities will also be um, publicizing the different programs that they are sponsoring as well as any other kind of relevant program. So if you are interested in a Knowledge Community, I would recommend joining it as soon as you can so that you can make sure that you get those updates as they become available and get closer to the conference. Um, and then not we're not specifically sponsoring it, but in the the um, the spirit of first gen, if you have the opportunity and the time and and the heart to do it, um, consider being a mentor um, for someone or attending some of the first time attendee events. Um, a lot of first time attendees are also first generation um, students uh, and participating in any any of the undergraduate track programs. Um, they have some really awesome things that are happening um, through there, um, partly in conjunction with NUF and then also sort of on its own. Thank you, Steve. Sarah, anything quick that you'd want to share? Sure, yeah, the center is very, very active um, when it comes to the NASA Annual Conference in LA. Um, we are hosting um, a half-day pre-conference workshop on Saturday that actually looks at the topic of faculty development around first-generation initiatives. So a little bit of room left in that in that pre-con um, to invite folks to come and join us for that. Um, each year we have the opportunity to, to gather our advocacy group to talk about the future of the center, so really excited to have those folks together. Um, I'm gonna be meeting with some folks in the at the Community College Institute to talk about our upcoming landscape analysis um, of two-year campuses. So excited to do that. And then we'll be doing a session on Monday um, about our four-year report and the findings of that as well. Um, all day on Monday and Tuesday, the center has a space in the exhibit hall, so we encourage folks to come by and see us and learn more about the center and get connected. We have our great reception that we're partnering with Steve on um, on Monday evening, and then in, on Tuesday, I will also be doing some time in the engagement room, um, sort of a new endeavor for the NASA Annual Conference and having some opportunities to, to teach folks and about the center and to learn about some of the things that are, that are going on. So lots and lots of ways to get in, involved um, and hope folks will also pick up uh, their name tag ribbons um, when they when they first come in. Um, we are always overwhelmed by how many first gen folks we have at the NASA Annual Conference and so excited to see everyone in a few weeks. 
Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing that. Um, so we're going to have to close this out. Sadly, it's been such a great conversation. So I want to thank um, all of you on the panel for taking the time to be here, for sharing your insights, for sharing your expertise, and also for sharing resources um, and for just engaging in this wonderful conversation. I want to thank also um, everyone who is listening, who is watching um, and engaging with this live briefing. And then I also want to thank a couple of folks, um, Dina Wayne, Wayne Traub Stafford and Jace Kushner for their help and others in coordinating uh, this conversation today and, and pulling this together with all of us. So thank you everyone for your time and we hope that um, that you get a lot out of this uh, out of this briefing today and that you'll join us for the other briefings that are upcoming. And have a great day. <laughs>